Hello, everybody. Welcome into the Apples and Genos Fantasy Hockey Podcast. My name is Nate Gernibling. I'm the creator of Apples and Genos, originator of the Zero G Draft Strategy. And in this podcast, I'm going to go over the most puzzling players league wide as submitted by the Apples and Genos Discord server. Let's get it. Hello, hello, welcome in, welcome in. I apologize to the people waiting patiently for the live stream. I have an 18-month-old that did not want to go down for her uh, bedtime routine this evening. So took a little longer, but we're here, and that's all that matters. We're here to talk some fantasy hockey, talk about some puzzling players and we'll jump right into it. Top of the list was Kirill Kaprizov. Now, Blake and I did talk about Kirill Kaprizov and kind of compared him with Tage Thompson uh, and Brady Tuchuk, actually. All three struggling in recent games here. You can see uh, on the screen if you're watching live on YouTube, just one assist in the last five games for, five games for Kaprizov. And nothing so far for Minnesota. They're currently down 3-0 to Pittsburgh in the game that's ongoing currently. So we'll see if Kaprizov puts anything on the score sheet tonight. If you're listening to this on the audio and podcast form, the next day you've probably got a better idea of what's gone on in this game here. But overall, like the shots have decreased for Kaprizov here in the last little bit. That's concerning. He's still producing shot attempts, just not getting the shots through, which is... Probably just an anomaly in a small sample size here. Overall, on the season now, a 23-goal, 70-point pace, that's going to change. Uh, I have a lot of confidence in that. On the season, his numbers are worse in terms of his individual numbers than last year, but he's been very consistent through his other years, and so this is the anomaly year in my mind. That's not to say that this current pace of shooting won't continue for this year and that we might have just a down year for Kaprizov in general but if you're placing bets on the rest of the season I would place the bet that Kaprizov gets back up there and that we're looking at a player that could very well have a 100 point pace from this point onwards for the rest of the season and I just want to be in on players like that we've seen it demonstrated multiple times throughout his career this guy has all the all the skill in the world has put it on tape for us time and time again. And we're really just going to sell him down the river for a 28 game stretch where he scores at only a 70 point pace. I'm not there for that. So I would buy low on Kaprizov if he is available in your leagues. All right, let's talk. Let's take some comments. We've got Antonio who was in here before we even got started. 12-team points league, Marchenko, Druin, Raquel, Eklund, Barbashev, Monahan, Benson. Which two are you taking for your team? Wild question, but so many decisions on the waiver wire, that's for sure. So if you were able to uh, get Monahan in and get him in for this game, this off-night game that's going on currently, um, then that would have been probably the way that I would lean. Montreal has a bit of a nice schedule this week in that regard where you can get, if you can fit them in, uh, uh, fit in the Montreal player for the games that Montreal does have this week, then you would actually be able to get those all in before the super heavy Saturday, which would be super valuable, obviously. Yeah, Montreal playing tonight here on Monday and then on Friday, which is also an off night, and then Thursday being the only heavy night this week. If you had a little bit of extra room to squeeze Monaghan in on Thursday, then you get three games out of Monaghan, which is actually a pretty good stream and a really good stream actually for this week in which we don't have any games on Sunday, and so we're missing out one crucial day of streaming goodness. So Monaghan would have been the answer if this question had come before this game started. If you're just looking at who these who the best of these players are then I'm pretty interested in Zach Benson right now 
basically just because of the deployment where he's playing in the lineup getting to play up in the top line the metrics have been climbing of late he's got a couple goals in his last five games plus an assist for three points and so i'm getting a little bit more interest in zach benson lots of people on fantasy twitter and draft twitter uh super into zach benson think that he's going to be a stud going to be a big time producer in the league maybe as soon as this season maybe not but at least while he's getting the top end deployment i uh, in the Buffalo top six there. Definitely worth a look. The other one that I'm uh, always interested in is Kirill Marchenko. He's been getting tons of deployment as well uh, in the last little bit. I talked a little bit about Igor Chinikov with Blake in the podcast that came out today. And Marchenko is obviously a beneficiary there as well. His metrics have curiously fallen off a lot from earlier when I was super excited about him. But two goals, four assists, or two goals, four points, rather, in his last five games while skating over 18 minutes a night. Uh, Marchenko has been, yeah, putting up points, and it's hard to argue with that. So I do like Marchenko. I'll continue to like Marchenko for most of the year, I think. Um, but Raquel, if he's available, is one that I do want to be in on. Uh, Honestly, Raquel had a great season last season. Um, obviously hasn't done much this year with the injuries. And yeah, before he got injured, he was doing absolutely nothing. But last year on Pittsburgh demonstrated a really high level of play. This year, Pittsburgh as a team is actually playing even better than they did last year in terms of their underlying statistics. It hasn't always translated to on-ice results, but with Raquel coming back, you can expect perhaps that he could get in on some of that, maybe help them turn the boat around a little bit there, um, just be a really valuable member of that top six and potentially get a lot of exposure to a red-hot Sidney Crosby. And that would obviously be the part that you get the most excited about. He was kind of slated to be the top power play, uh, fourth, uh, fourth or fifth member of the top power play, however you want to look at it, the final member of the top power play that wasn't kind of exceptionally obvious just based on their personnel. So uh, I don't know if that'll come screaming back for Ricard Raquel, if he'll get that right away. Um, but definitely, I think Raquel is the one that has the most, um, the most, the uh, most, long-standing uh, favor with the team, I guess, if I could say it that way. A lot of these other guys that you've mentioned here have some interest for sure, um, but Raquel, I feel like, is the one that has built something there already and is actually a legitimate producer in his own right as well. So uh, if I have to pick between all these right now, I think I would take Raquel for sure and then it'd be between Benson and Marchenko. If you're just picking for this week, it might be Benson. If you're picking more long-term, I might go Marchenko. Brendan McDonald's in here saying thoughts on Pavel Minchikov was hot, then cold, now becoming hot again. Yeah, if you listen to Blake and I talk about him on the waiver wire show, uh, honestly, any point in the last month, uh, people have been slowly getting off him. His Yahoo roster ship has been decreasing and decreasing. Um, and then, yeah, in the last couple of games here, the Ducks have scored a bunch of goals, and Minchikov's gotten in on that. He's got three assists in his last five before the game tonight, and he's got a goal in the game tonight already. And I think that Minchikov is just kind of, he is what he is, in my opinion. He's a guy who's going to skate probably 18 to 19 minutes for the Ducks most of the year. Maybe there's a chance he gets more than that. If he gets more than that, then I'm super interested in what Minchikov can do. The underlying metrics have been pretty solid for a guy uh, who's, a teenager and playing defense in the National Hockey League for a bad team like pretty solid stuff honestly from Minchikov I'm pretty I'm pretty excited about the player long term for sure now I don't think you can reasonably expect him to do much more you look now he's got a 44 point pace on the season and I think realistically, that's probably where he about caps out. You see the 48% IPP and the 9.2% on ice shooting percentage. I think realistically, the 48% IPP is potentially on the high side there. And the on ice shooting percentage at 9.2% is probably about where he caps out as well. So I think realistically, this is probably a 40 point defenseman in his current deployment. But you do have the chance that he gets trusted a little bit more as the season wears on. If he, you know, if he can withstand the rigors of 
of an 82 game schedule in the NHL. He could always end up getting more and more deployment as the season wears on, or Jamie Drysdale could come in and he could take a bunch of minutes away from Pavel Minchikov. That's a concern as well. So I'd like to see where Drysdale slots in and how that potentially affects Drysd- uh, Minchikov rather moving forward. I'd like to see that before making any proclamations, but in terms of the talent of the player, I think Minchikov is plenty, plenty talented. Toronto Dave's in here. Hashtag zero G. Good to see you, buddy. Lenny, thoughts on Ekblad? My second last draft pick in my fifth D. Good depth option or better off as a streamer spot? I just find I have knights with forwards on the bench but always have a D slot open. Yeah, I'm happy to roster Ekblad as a fifth D. I think that's a good spot to be. Um, I... I kind of feel like he's in a spot now where I do believe that Montour is going to be the guy. And we saw even when Montour came off the power play for one game, it was Oliver ekman Larson that went back up there for that game. That didn't work, and they went right back to Montour. And now Montour has had a decent game and is probably working on solidifying that spot. But I do think that Ekblad is a plenty talented player. You can see in these four games that I have called up on the sheet here, he was 11th amongst defensemen, Corsi 4 per 60, 35th in scoring chances, 4 per 60. Ekblad has continually been a good shot producer. The Panthers are a great offensive environment. Even if he is only really a power play two top pairing defenseman for the rest of the season, I still think you can expect 45 to 50 points as a pace for Ekblad, and that's plenty valuable as your fifth defenseman. Um, I don't think, I think he's above a streamer level player for sure in anything like a 12 team league, a pretty standard 12 team league uh, Yahoo kind of settings then i do think he's above that so i would be hanging on to him i do agree there's um yeah going to be lots of times where you can find an extra spot for that defenseman because you have four defenseman spots and it's pretty easy to for one of them to have an off night or to not have as many games that week and you can find a spot to slot that defenseman in so ekblad i think as a fifth defenseman you're doing just fine justin reed is in here he asks what Evander Kane been up to lately? Uh, I've not typed in the name, not Evander Kane. That's funny. Uh, Evander Kane been up to a goal, two points in his last five, just over 16 and a half minutes average time on ice. Underlying metrics have taken a bit of a dive, but typically Kane is definitely somebody who presents a lot of shots and hits and does all those peripheral things that we love so much for category leagues. And I really don't see any reason to expect anything different. I think at this point, the ship has sailed. He's never going to be on top power play without an injury to one of their top players. So if you're still holding out hope for that, I really don't think you should be. Uh, The problem right now is that they've kind of split up their lines in a weird way, at least in this last game the Oilers have, where Kane was on a line with Connor Brown and Ryan McLeod. That's just not a great spot. You need Kane to have exposure to either McDavid or Dreisaitl to be really excited or even happy, probably, with his 5v5 output, which is where he's getting most of his output, considering that he's not on the top power play. So I think you're going to have to ride some ups and downs with Evander Kane in a Cats League, Bangers cats league where you're counting his hits then he's a no-brainer he's an everyday player Um, no questions asked in a points league or even a points only league where his hits and his shots are a little bit more muted then it does come into question a little bit more but i do think that kane like you see him right now on a 35 goal 64 point pace for the season I think that that's plenty doable. 79% IPP is high, but the 9.6% on ice shooting percentage, I think, should come up. So I think those things probably balance each other out, and this is probably about the pace that I would expect for him rest of season. Ricky's in here. I'll hold because there's no better options, but curious on Lucas Raymond. He's been quiet of late, but the team overall is playing poorly. So I'm thinking when they play better overall, so will he. It's a good thought, Um, just a general approach to player analysis. Yeah, Raymond's got one goal, two points in his last five, and it's getting close to 20 minutes a night, which is pretty interesting, obviously, for him. In the game that's going on, he's on a line with JT Comfer and Alex Debrinkit. Uh, I was just going to check to see if any goals have been scored since I started here. Nothing, and Lucas Raymond is minus two. So <laughs> there's that going on. Uh, 53rd in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60 over these last five games. So he's been doing that a little bit. Underlying metrics are not great, but also Larkin's been out of the lineup, which has really uh, thrown their entire forward core into flux and has definitely hurt all of the wingers there. Just 
not having any centers to play with. Comfort's been out too, so they've been really, really barren down the middle. Joe Valeno is not a top six forward in my opinion. So overall on the season, you see him at a 27 goal, 66 point pace. That's with a 67% IPP, 10.9% on ice shooting percentage. That feels about right, honestly, for Lucas Raymond. Um, yeah, 27 goals, 66 points uh, as a season-long pace. I feel like that can continue. If he is going to get close to 20 minutes a night, then obviously you'd get a little bit more excited. But on the season, pacing just under 18 minutes a night. And if he can sustain that, I think you feel pretty good about that 65-ish point pace. Anthony asks, do you think the coaching change in Ottawa will snap them out of their slump? This is an interesting one, and uh, I did have DJ Smith listed in here. Some people were asking about this very question already in the Discord. And by the way, if you're not in the Apples and Genos Discord server already, check the show description, click that link, get in there, and you can get your puzzling players queued, and they will be talked about on this show, guaranteed. But DJ Smith getting canned uh, by the Ottawa Senators, honestly, had been seeing this one coming for a long time, as had many others. I was not alone in that, but... Um, yeah, it's just a situation where it feels like they have plenty of talent up and down the lineup, but they've not been able to put together any kind of cohesiveness or really, and possibly most crucially, any kind of defensive game, despite having, you know, Jake Sanderson, Thomas Shabbat, Jacob Shikrin. Those are all pretty solid, at least top forward uh, kind of defensemen, if not top pair style defensemen in the league already. And so you wonder where that's coming from and why they couldn't figure that out. And you kind of do have to point the finger at the coach at some point uh, in all of that. I think that it's pretty hard to say exactly what the new system will be. Jacques Martin is going to take over for now. It's been a long time since Jacques Martin has been a coach in National Hockey League. It's kind of hard to say. I don't want to, you know, just go back and look at what he did when he was a coach and just say, oh, he's going to coach the exact same way now. We actually see this with some coaches. Um, they get fired and they actually go away. If they don't come back immediately, then they go away and they actually do change uh, some of their philosophies and change the way they approach the game. You know, some coaches go from being throw everything at the net, generate a bunch of attempts, gen uh, try to dominate possession, that kind of thing and they change to be a little bit more okay let's be a little bit more selective with our shots try to maintain possession but uh, get only better quality chances to score so you do see coaches change uh, over the years especially if they come away from the game for a little bit so we'll see exactly what that manifests itself as for the Senators here. Overall, DJ Smith has cultivated a pretty strong offensive environment for the Senators uh, in the last couple of years here once they've kind of assembled all this firepower. And so I'm a little bit concerned that, you know, for example, you've heard me talk a lot about Josh Norris in the last week. He had a great week last week, was one of our better streamer picks uh, this this year. Uh, and I'm a little bit worried. Like, what if Norris has another cold stretch? Um, will the new coach just say, yeah, off the top power play, let's change things around. Drake Batherson, same thing. Um, feel like Brady to Chuck, Tim Stutzler, those guys are pretty entrenched, but who knows? Um, on the flip side, you know, maybe this is a spot where Jacob Chikrin gets a little bit more love under the new coach, and per perhaps he gets up on the top power play. There's lots of different things that can happen um, do I think it'll actually snap them out of the slump that they're in? I think the there's usually some sort of bounce with a new coach. Everybody's a little bit motivated to play well for a new coach, and so everybody gives 110% for a few games. That's not really sustainable over the course of an 82-game season. No player can give even uh, realistically 100%. I, I forget where I heard this. There was a really good interview I heard one time where a player was like, um, you know, you really can't expect players to give 100% every single game. It burns players out. Uh, they end up putting themselves in bad positions and getting injured and things like that. You have to accept that most players in a lot of situations are going to coast by on 85% efficiency or something like that. Uh, and that's good enough most nights over the course of an 82-game season with obvious you know, scenarios where you're down a goal or something. You got to tune things up. But um, it's just an interesting uh, thought, I guess. But how does it relates to the Ottawa Senators? I do think for the next few games here, everybody's going to be on edge. Everybody's going to be hopping. And that usually does relate um, to a bit of a bounce back uh, for the team after a coach gets fired. It's usually how things go. I would expect something similar here. Um, but they're also going to need some goaltending for that to happen. And goaltending, as you all know, is not something I'm willing to project or predict. 
Matthew says Raquel is starting out on Sid's line when he is ready. Yeah, I do believe he's out there on that line currently. I don't believe he's gotten any points. I was just checking that uh, as I was loading up into here. Yeah, it's the Crosby against a Raquel line that's going on. I don't believe that's resulted in any points for Raquel so far. No, uh, but that is a good spot. Uh, it does look like Pustinen has held on to his top power play billing for the time being, though, which is pretty interesting. Uh, he's actually been pretty solid in there, and he's got a couple assists again tonight. So continue to watch that one for sure. And we'll see where it goes, but uh, definitely interesting. Uh, Valeteri Pustin and uh, exactly what the Pittsburgh power play needed to get uh, get itself started. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Agent Orange Bjorkstrand has quietly been one of the Kraken's best forwards, but stuck on line three for some reason. Yeah, I mean... We talk about this too. Line three in Seattle is kind of the exact same as line one. You look at the even strength minutes. Uh, I could pull that up too. Just what it's been the last game or the last number of games. Oh, the game's already started, so I can't pull up the last game on Frozen Tools. But um, yeah, they've, they're have they just pretty even throughout the top nine. They just really rotate those top three lines. And usually it ends up within like a minute or two in terms of 5v5 strength. So I'm not too worried about that. Bjorkstrand actually did go through a stretch where he's getting even more minutes. Some of that was power play time, but some of that was just his 5v5 line was the best thing they had going with Tolvanen and Yanni Gord. Both Yanni Gord and Ily Tolvanen have been terrific as well. And so they've really just been playing really well together. And so they've been running those guys out there. And so... I don't think uh, I'm too worried about him being stuck on the quote-unquote third line. Aman says, need to drop one guy. Who would you drop? Erod, Norris, Ryan O'Reilly, 14-team points league, including plus minus and PIMS. Uh, that's probably going to be Evan Rodriguez for me. I don't feel great about that because um, he should have solid plus minus. Um yeah, it, and especially with the uh, with the coaching change in Ottawa, you don't know exactly what that's going to do for Josh Norris, uh, positively or negatively. Uh, but if I have to make a call right now, it would be Evan Rodriguez. All right, got through the comments for now. Keep them coming. I will continue to answer them as we move on through. But I got to get through some of these players. Troy Terry finally on the score sheet. Been calling this one for a while. Two goals, four points in his last five games here, averaging over 18 and a half minutes. And I do believe I will double check this to make sure I'm not perjuring myself. But yeah, Terry's got a goal and an assist here tonight. Another strong night going for the man. We'd love to see it. I have been a proponent of Troy Terry. I thought, honestly, he was going to have a really, really strong season. Obviously had major struggles early on. Uh, finally, the shots started to come around. You could see it coming up in his underlying numbers. I got pretty excited about Troy Terry. I started telling people I was excited about Troy Terry, and finally the points are coming. So love to see it when the plan all comes together, when the metrics point to something, and then the production starts coming thereafter. Uh, this is why I do what I do and why I look at the metrics that I look at is for situations like this. So, uh, yeah, on the season, I think especially as the Ducks continue to get healthy. Obviously, you heard me talk about McTavish and Zegris and how these guys are tearing my heart out going along on these trips and not actually playing and um, still continuing to hold Mason McTavish, just expecting that he's going to play sometime. Uh, don't have an IR plus slot for him in that league because I got a bunch of other injuries, but it's so hard to drop McTavish given what he had done earlier in the season. Troy Terry's on a 19-goal, 49-point pace for the season that's going to come up. Uh, this is definitely a guy who can convert at a much higher efficiency and should get a significant boost from the returning players there. So I'm very, very bullish on Troy Terry to definitely go over that 49 point pace, but probably to push 70 point pace for the rest of the season, as well as the Ducks continue to get healthy. John Carlson. So I actually had the John Carlson queued up to talk with Blake uh, in the show that we recorded yesterday, but uh, time was running out and I figured that John Carlson was going to be a big topic for puzzling players anyway. So I figured we'd delay and we'd talk about him here once again. He's been a regular on this segment. Feels like, uh, feels like just that hot rod player for this year where, um, 
for whatever reason, he can't put it together with just one assist in his last five games, still getting all the minutes, averaging over 25 and a half minutes a night through these last five games. Underlying metrics have been bad for Carlson, which is the most puzzling part for sure about him. 122nd in shots for 60, 195th in individual scoring chances for per 60 amongst all defensemen in these past five games. The on-ice stats have been a little bit better. 102nd in Corsi, 4 per 60, 85th in scoring chances, 4 per 60. On the season, he's pacing for just three goals, 44 points. That's with a 48% IPP, but just an 8.2% on-ice shooting percentage. I think the on-ice shooting percentage definitely comes up. That puts him, you know, at a 50-plus point pace. Is he going to get back to that 65 to 70 point pace that I really thought was going to be there for him this year? Um, as a pace, I, def I definitely think it's possible. Um, I will say that. I definitely think it's possible. But he's been cold, and now the metrics have gone cold on him, which is really concerning. Um, I still believe in the player. I don't think he's just suddenly forgotten how to play hockey or that the age curve has finally hit him because earlier in the year, the metrics were all there. He just wasn't producing. Now the metrics are not there and he's not producing, which is obviously a more concerning state. But the fact that he had them before makes me think that he can get them again. Um, so I do think that there are better days ahead for Carlson. Um, Maybe it's not necessarily a player you want to go out and buy low right now, just given that he's so cold and the metrics are not great either. Um, but I'm, I'm struggling to think of who you're going to drop John Carlson for. Again, I was talking about this with Blake, like who's out there in a standard 12 team league on the defenseman waiver wire, who's going to be so much better than John Carlson's 44 point pace right now. Uh, you're going to be hard pressed to find somebody who's better than that. And that's with uh, some, positive regression that I think should be coming for him even regardless of these poor metrics that he's got going on currently so overall I still think Carlson's better than waiver wire options I'm not going to be dropping him you know if he got bumped off the top power play if his minutes took a big hit if some things like that started to happen okay then I'm really starting to get concerned about John Carlson but until then I just don't feel like I can reasonably drop him for any of the options that you'll see out on your waiver wire commonly right now. So if you've got a specific situation uh, in your league where, you know, there's a guy that you're actually pretty pumped about out on the waiver wire and you want to hit me up, um, maybe it's like an eight team league or a 10 team league or something a little bit more shallow, you want to hit me up, we can talk about it. But uh, in most cases, the vast majority of cases, I would say I'm continuing to hang on to John Carlson. Brent Burns is another player who fits into this mold. Just one assist in his last five games, averaging about 20 and a half minutes a night the last five games. 63rd in shots per 60, but 10th in shot attempts per 60 in the last five games. 20th in individual scoring chances for per 60. Also 17th in Corsi for per 60, uh, which is something that you honestly typically see from players on the Carolina Hurricanes. They're typically a team that generates a ton of shot attempts. So, again, in Carolina, we have Tony D'Angelo getting back into the lineup basically exclusively to play on the top power play, which limits Brent Burns. There's no two ways about that. That's what's happening right now. It's not exciting, but I do think that Burns has, again, better days ahead. On the season, you see 22nd in shots per 60, 3rd in shot attempts per 60. 31% IPP is very uncharacteristic for Brent Burns. That should be like 10% higher for him. 10.8% on ice shooting percentage feels about right. But honestly, I think like at a 34 point pace, he's probably left, you know, maybe like a third more production on top. So you're talking about a guy who should have maybe like a 45 point pace at this point in the season based on the underlying metrics so far. That's going to be valuable. He's still going to provide a ton of shots. If you're in uh, a Cats league, he doesn't hit a lot. So take that into account if you're in a Bangers league. But overall, again, I kind of come back to this thing, like who out there is a lot better than Brent Burns? Sure, he's been cold in the last little bit, and that's hard to stomach uh, just watching the zeros pile up. Uh, but if you're looking at a more long-term view, which I would encourage you to do with these kind of players, are you really going to just go out and chase whichever defenseman got two points in his last game or are you going to stick with somebody who's done it before whose metrics are not bad um, and just continue to ride it out and hope that Tony D'Angelo gets shipped away so that he can get even more deployment and be even better 
All right, let's get back into some comments. We've got Elo saying, hello, love your show watching from Australia. That's awesome. Love to have people from all over the world joining in. That's sweet. Uh, glad to have you in here. Amon says, thank you. Thank you for your question, Amon. Matthew says, can Tom Wilson keep up this offensive surge? Tom Wilson has been taking his game to a new level this year. It's been pretty impressive, to be quite honest. 49th in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60 over the last five games. couple goals, couple assists, averaging 19 and a half minutes a night, getting plenty of deployment, doing all the things that you like to see for fantasy purposes. 78% IPP is high, but the 8.1% on a shooting percentage definitely has room to grow. Basically, as soon as Ovechkin figures it out, which I do believe he will at some point, maybe not to, you know, like a 45 or 50 goal point pace or goal pace for the rest of the season, but to a 35 to 40 goal pace, I think is still definitely within the cards for Ovechkin as a pace for the rest of the season. If that happens, Wilson will obviously be a beneficiary. He's on a 29 goal, 53 point pace currently, and I think he's got room to grow from that. So I do like Tom Wilson a fair bit. And I think what he's doing right now is completely legit, given the extra minutes that he's been getting as of late. L. Paxson says, I'm trading Debrinket for Montour thoughts. So uh, Debrinket was on this list to talk about, so we can run through him real quick. Two assists in his last five games, averaging about 20 and a half minutes per night. Metrics are still decent, 62nd in shots per 60, 60th in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60. Um, on the season, a 36 goal, 71 point pace now. He's definitely gone very cold after a torrid start. But, I mean, look at the numbers uh, on the season, 65% IPP, 11.2% on ice shooting percentage. You know, maybe the IPP goes up a little and the on-ice shooting percentage comes down a little. 71 points for Debrinket is definitely within the cards and potentially more, especially if he continues to get 20-plus minutes a night. Um, overall, I do think Montour has a ton of potential to just absolutely smash rest of season. You can see it in his metrics. I was talking him up as the biggest buy low in the league. And I do still think that that's the case. I do still think he's plenty worth going out to get. If people are out there and are sour on him and we're just waiting for this two-point game to as an excuse to sell him not quite so low as they might have had to before. So, yeah. Overall, um, very in on Montour. For Debrinket, it's pretty tough. Because Debrinket, I do think, is a legitimate you know, top end goal scorer in the league and point, uh, point getter. And the recent deployment has been really good. Underlying metrics have been solid despite the lack of production. Overall, um, yeah, honestly, I think it's kind of a wash. Uh, if you need the defenseman, uh, then by all means go get Montour. If you need, if you, uh, if you need the winger, then Debrinket is probably the one that you want to hang on to. So it might just come down to positional eligibility and what you really need the most. Ricky says, worth noting, Burns was back on Parplay 1 in practice today, and Svetch may be back tomorrow. Thanks for that, Ricky. I hadn't seen that one yet, so that's good news. Uh, would love, obviously, to see Brent Burns back on Parplay 1 and would raise his stock some as well. CG says, with goalie injuries for both teams, who's the better add, Kachekov or Wedgwood? This is interesting. Um, there was some news today. Jake Ottinger labeled week to week. So um, week to week is still a pretty nebulous term, but at least we have some sort of timetable to assess his uh, potential to come back at some point. Um, definitely both teams are terrific. I'll say that up front. Uh, Dallas and Carolina definitely want to be rostering goalies from these teams uh, if they're getting starts, basically regardless of who the goalie is, I'd be interested. Kachekov has played pretty decently of late. And Carolina, I think, can turn some things around here. And we know that Freddie Anderson is about a month away. Um, so just given the timetable for Anderson, I think I'd lean Kachetkov because he has the potential to give you a longer stretch of play here. And Wedgwood obviously hasn't given us, you know, any real reason to think that he can be a terrific player in a starting role for any length of time. I'm still excited to pick him up for a minute um, and see where it goes, but I can't say that I would take him over Kachekov, so I will lean Kachekov there. Justin asks, Yugor Chinikov must add. We talked about Chinikov in the pod uh, yesterday. Blake and I did. Uh, 
basically, I think it comes down to this. I think Vincent likes the Chinakov line, the Russian line, and he's going to give them plenty of deployment, and that's going to result in decent production. But I don't think Chinakov is really much more than a streamer-level player rest of season. Dan asks, are there any signs showing Chandler Stevenson's bouncing back and worth rostering? We can check that one out for a moment for you, Dan. He's got four goals, six points in his last five games. Definitely been coming uh, coming off the schneid after being pretty cold for a while there. Averaging still under 17 minutes a night. I haven't actually checked the Vegas power play in a hot minute to see what they've been doing. Stevenson was a fixture on there, but with William Carlson's a hotness this year. He's kind of taken that spot and supplanted Stevenson on the top power play. He was still there in the last game. Overall, um, I'm just never that excited about Stevenson. It's a guy who doesn't shoot the puck. 230th in shots for 60. To get to these four goals in five games, he had to shoot 44%. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the player that Stevenson is. On the season now, 18 goal, 53 point pace. That's with a 60% IPP, 11.6% on ice shooting percentage. Honestly, I think he might even give up a few goals, but kind of hang on to the 53 point pace. So if that does it for you, then that's fine. But yeah, I'm not getting excited about Chandler Stevenson and considering him a must roster. CG says, thank you for your service. <laughs> Thanks for that, CG. All right, let's get back into the players here. Sean Dursey was put forward as a player to talk about. So Dursey's obviously gotten a huge role in Arizona, averaging almost 22 and a half minutes a night on 25 games played this season. Has been out for a while with injury. The IPP has been down this year. It's a little bit hard to figure out exactly if that's just a function of him getting more minutes and being exposed to better players who are dominating the play a little bit more than he used to in his limited minutes in LA. Overall, I'm still very interested in Jersey. I do think the 11.4% uh, 11 shooting percentage on the season is going to come down. The 13.6% on ice shooting percentage on the season is going to come down. And so you could see some regression in that front, but the IPP uh, positive regression potential could kind of counterbalance that. So um, basically I'm interested in anyone who's playing top power play on a halfway decent team like the Coyotes are and skating 22 and a half minutes a night. So I like Dursey. I'm not going to say that I think he has some tremendous ceiling because I don't, uh, but you know, uh, 50 point pace is well within the realm of possibility for Jersey and he's going to block. He does that uh, actually one of the bigger blockers across the league. So definitely somebody you can get into for that overall. Um, yeah, I think Jersey kind of is what he is. He's not going to blow your socks off, but he's going to be a valuable piece for you. Patrick Kane, we talked about Debrinket. We should talk about Kane here. I don't believe Kane factored into this goal. I'll just double check. Oh, he did. He got an assist on the goal here from Jeff Petrie. It's end of the second now. 4-1 Ducks over the Red Wings. Kane's got an extra assist, so you could take that into account. In the five games prior, he had one goal, one assist for two points in the last five. Averaging 20 minutes a night, 71st in shots per 60, 131st in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60. Yeah, Kane was somebody I was never really super interested in rostering. It felt like the potential win there was never going to be the biggest win, uh, even if he did come back and show basically no ill effects from the pretty significant injury and surgery and uh, uh, everything that he went through to get back to where he's at now. Uh, that being said, like the metrics have been pretty decent uh, since he's come back. It's obviously been a short, uh, small sample so far. Uh, but if he's going to continue to play a ton of minutes and to uh, play on a top power play, Larkin comes back, you can see how things could turn around for Patrick Kane and he could be a valuable piece moving forward. still think that we don't have enough data to conclusively say what he's going to be on the season, but it wouldn't shock me at all if Kane is at least a 65-point pace player for the rest of the season just based on the early returns. Zach Benson, as I mentioned uh, a little bit before talking about Zach Benson, I am interested in him and how the Sabres have been pushing him up the lineup, using him a little bit more in that regard. Played with Alex Tuck and Tage Thompson in the last game, and I think I'd have to fact check uh, fact checked myself once again here, but I do believe I saw a tweet about the... Uh, 
about the lines and he could be back up there again it looked like it was thompson benson and quinn on the top line tuck having a maintenance day today and quinn might be back as soon as tomorrow so all that to say benson's still on the top line with Tate thompson that's a good spot to be no doubt about it two goals three points in his last five games averaging over 17 minutes a night underlying metrics as i mentioned have started to come up but they're still not great 163rd in shots per 60 159th in individual scoring chances four per 60 best metric that i can say for him here is the on ice number 94th in Corsi four per 60 over the last five I like Zach Benson. Uh, I think he's got a bright future. I will say rookies tend to just kind of be a bit of a roller coaster ride. They go up and they go down throughout the season. While he's on the top line, happy to roster him, but not viewing him in redraft leagues as anything more than a streamer at this point. Timo Meyer has zero points in his last five games. And actually, I'd have to check to see how far back this goes because I'm pretty sure it's going back beyond uh, just a five game stretch here. Let me pull up Timo Meyer's game log. Uh, it goes back, it goes back a long way now. Uh, yeah. It has been a hot minute since Timo Meyer has cracked the score sheet in any regard. It's really puzzling, right? Eight games that Timo Meyer has gone without a point. There's been some games where he's gotten shots, like plenty of shots. The last game he had four shots. Game before that, one shot. Game before that, six shots. Two games before that, one shot each. It's just yo-yoing up and down for Timo Meyer. It's really hard to deal with, um, for sure. Really frustrating for his fantasy managers. In these last five games, though, 82nd in shots per 60, 38th in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60. Still putting that out there. I still think he's... Like, I don't think he, for, again, forgot how to play hockey or anything like that. Uh, I'm not going to go so far as to say anything outrageous like that. But it is concerning that, uh, yeah, I mean, Lenny Ruff has moved him around the lineup as he's not been, you know, just uh, putting himself out there, putting himself in a great light <laughs> in terms of his production to be moved up the lineup. So it's really hard to say what we should expect from Meyer moving forward. That being said, the metrics alone should provide him with definitely more production than the current 19 goal, 41 point pace that he's on. It's just hard to say exactly what kind of heights we could be looking at. Did play with Palat and Heischer in the last game. You obviously want to have Jack Hughes exposure in an ideal scenario, but you would take Miko Heischer as the center. Worst case is when he gets moved further down the lineup uh, with like the Dawson Mercer types. That's the worst case scenario for Timo Meyer. Uh, this is kind of where I was at with Timo Meyer, though. I uh, didn't think, obviously, that he'd be at a 41-point pace, but I did see it as a potential where he would, you know, not get all the minutes all the time. Still thought he'd be on the top power play, which hasn't come true. But even to get to this 41-point pace at a 17 minutes average time on ice, he's got a 58% IPP and an 8.9% on ice shooting percentage, which is pretty shocking considering that he's on the Devils, which are a good team. So overall, I think we're probably looking at a player who's at minimum going to get back to a 60-point pace and probably has some upside beyond that up to a 70-point pace at least. Um, really don't think that, you know, like I heard some people saying like 90-point pace potential for Timo Meyer. really don't think that was ever in the cards and it's definitely not something that you can foresee for Timo Meyer at the current moment. But again, this is a player who generates a ton of scoring chances and he's going to convert on some of these at some point. He's going to play his way back up the lineup. I'm being patient with Meyer where I have him I know it's feels impossible to do so when he's stuck in a crazy cold streak like he is currently but I do believe this comes back um, at least given the metrics that we're looking at currently so I am holding on to Meyer I do consider him a buy low um, you know you're not excited about going out to buy low on Timo Meyer given that he's got no production in the last little bit but I still would uh, if the right opportunity presented itself CG says the Apples and G's pod is the best fantasy hockey platform out there, period. Appreciate you, CG. Alduin asks, thoughts on Drysdale? Think he gets power play one when he returns? Uh, honestly, I don't think so. Fowler had kind of been on power play one over Drysdale, even when Drysdale was healthy. So I think they're kind of happy with Minchikov uh, at the moment. That's my take on it. I mean, that take could be thrown in the garbage as soon as the next game when Drysdale does come back. But... Um, that's my take currently is I don't think Drysdale is going to get on power play one unless they get really unhappy with Minchikov there. 
Antonio asks, who do you think has more potential long-term this season, Jack Quinn or Benson? I would take Quinn there. Quinn started to show some things definitely uh, before injury uh, kind of derailed the season here. But uh, I do think that Jack Quinn has shown more, basically. He's had more opportunity to show more, clearly, than Zach Benson, who's a rookie this year. Um, but I do think if you're just talking about this season I, and like taking a bet on who will have the most points uh, rest of season from this point onward, I would take Jack Quinn pretty comfortably. All right, let's get back into Matt Zuccarello. Just one assist in his last five games. I will go back and double-check the Minnesota game that's ongoing to see if he got in on anything. Oh, yeah, he missed the game, didn't he? I totally missed that. Uh, I, Mondays are crazy for me. I uh, ran around. Obviously, I mentioned before, I had to get my 18-month-old into bed and didn't have time to really look through a bunch of news, but I did think I saw something. Maybe somebody in the chat can let me know. I think Zuccarello's missing this game here tonight. Uh, some sort of day-to-day -day issue, if I'm recalling. But uh, yeah, Zuccarello, the last five games anyway. One assist, averaging 17 and a half minutes. Uh, 240th in shots for 60. I mean, he's never been a big-time shot producer. It's really been about the on-ice production and the exposure to Kaprizov. And obviously Kaprizov not having the biggest season necessarily uh, kind of leads to Zuccarello having some stretches like this as well. Honestly, Zuccarello's kind of held his own, though, even without Kaprizov having a great season. 18 goal pace, but 82 point pace for Zuccarello on the season and maintained really, really solid uh, on ice numbers. 20th in Corsi 4 per 60, 19th in scoring chances 4 per 60 on the season. Uh, I, I think Zuccarello kind of is what he is. I'm not worried about this latest stretch. Uh, if there is an injury situation, I'm going to have to go read up on that and see what that is a little bit more. I don't want to speculate on an injury I don't know the extent of. So um, we'll read up on that. And that obviously has to be a bit of the calculus here as you evaluate the player. But in terms of his ability to produce points moving forward, I pretty much have no doubt in Zuccarello's ability the zucchini man that's it that's it for you blake all right that no, was that one's just for you matthew to chuck one goal one assist two points since last five games how long are we going to do this mr to chuck a 14 goal 57 point pace for matthew to chuck a lot of like myself included projected this guy for 100 plus points this year the shots have fallen off 251st in shots per 60 151st in individual scoring chances 4 per 60 but the on ice numbers are still way up there 10th in Corsi 4 per 60 17th in scoring chances 4 per 60 um, interestingly enough to Chuck has typically done this where his on ice numbers have been better than his individual numbers he's definitely elevated his team more than he's elevated himself you can see on the season his individual numbers are fine it's just been this last stretch that hasn't been quite so good 57% IPP, that's going to come way up. 9.1% on ice shooting percentage, I do think that comes way up. The 4.6% individual shooting percentage, definitely coming way up. Um, still in on the player, still believe, like, um, I think it's as likely as not that he scores at a 90 plus point pace from this point in the season onward. Um, I guess take that for what it's worth. Uh, whatever that means to you, you can do with that information what you will. But um, yeah, I'd be shocked if Matthew Tuchuk didn't turn this season around at some point and probably in the very near future. Nick Schmaltz has zero points in his last five games. Been dealing with an injury, as Blake and I talked about. Still averaging over 20 minutes a night, which was kind of interesting despite the injury that he's playing through. The... Uh, all his metrics have really cratered in the last bit, which may just be a function of that injury. 355th in shots per 60, 219th in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60, 238th in on-ice Corsi, 4 per 60. You get the idea. The numbers, the metrics have not been kind to schmaltz over the last little bit. And honestly, they haven't been great on the season either. This has been a little bit par for the course, which is a little bit concerning for Nick Schmaltz. Not a spot that we're used to seeing him in. 65% IPP, 10.3% on ice shooting percentage is probably not uh, all that far off from where you expect him to be. Maybe the IPP comes up a little bit there, but uh, overall numbers, maybe not that far off. I do think he can get back to a 70 point pace, but I am pretty concerned that it appears that this injury is something that's light, uh, nagging and lingering and could really potentially take a bite out of his season here. So if you're in a spot where you feel like Schmaltz is the next guy up to drop and 
you need a win and there's somebody out there who you really think can help you get that win. I'm not going to fault you for dropping Nick Schmaltz at this point just because it does seem to be a function of that injury, the recent stretch of play. Um, but overall, you know, my feelings on Nick Schmaltz, the player, have not changed. I don't think... Uh, he's yeah, just going to be a 55-point pace player for the rest of his career. As long as he's getting 20-plus minutes, playing top minutes for the Coyotes, I'm going to be interested in Nick Schmaltz. Do think he'll at some point maybe, you know, it all depends on the injury, right? Maybe not even this season if he has to play through something for the rest of the season, but he will be back and he will score again at a 70 plus point pace. It's really just about whether this injury limits him and that's scary. And that's a legitimate thing to be scared of uh, and to be concerned about. So um, you can take that for what you will, but uh, if you need to make a move away from Nick Schmaltz and he's the last player on your roster, I'm not going to fault you for it. All right. Matthew says, thanks for doing this stuff. A and G also stands for all in good. <laughs> thanks, Matthew. CG says Zuccarell isn't in tonight yet. I uh, did see that. Also says, got offered Malkin for Heesher. Thoughts on that? It's an interesting trade for sure. Uh, I'll put two players up on the sheet here and we can look at them side by side. But um, definitely both really good offensive environments. Heesher is the hotter player of late. Malkin getting a little bit more deployment under the hood. He sure looks a little bit better, but the on-ice numbers for Malkin have been absolutely terrific. He's just been getting in on a little bit less of that offense. On the season, very similar numbers. A 28 goal, 68 point pace for Malkin. 32 goal, 64 point pace for Heesher. Um, overall, I do feel like I have to lean Heesher. It just feels safer given his role on the team. Um, and, you know, still a younger player, Malkin, obviously, on more on the tail end of his career. And you have to feel like uh, it could tail off a little bit more for Malkin at some point in the season than you think is possible for Heesher. I will say Heesher's deployment this year is a little bit different than we are expecting averaging around 17 and a half minutes uh, which is not something we're expecting but that also gives him a little bit more headroom to improve if they do give him more minutes moving forward you know they get more injuries and they're forced to kind of concentrate on their top six a little bit more he sure could get more minutes moving forward and that could result in more production so overall i think i would lean he sure still uh, between the two players Zach Wierenski was requested here for assists in his last five games, skating almost 27 minutes a night. 30th in shots for 60, 13th in individual scoring chances for per 60 amongst all defensemen in that span. 70th in Corsi 4 per 60, 47th in scoring chances 4 per 60. On a three goal but 63 point pace for the season is Zach Wierenski. Um, you've heard me talk about Zach Wierenski. I think the world of this player, I think that the 63 point pace is actually like something he could potentially sustain uh, when everything's going well. The problem is that everything is not going well in Columbus. They have major injuries to top players. It's just a tough spot to be in, and so I am a little bit concerned about what that could potentially mean for Wierenski's point-scoring potential uh, in the immediate term here. So I believe in the player 100%. No questions about the player in my mind and the, his ability uh, to put points on the board and to do it somewhat uh, irrespective of who he's playing with. But you can't take away Line and Jenner and expect that that won't hurt Warensky in any regard. That does take away offense from the team and it will come to roost for all, all the players that uh, would normally get exposure to those solid top six players. So... Um, overall, I'm tempering a little bit of expectations for Warensky because of that, but I do think that He's going to continue to do his thing and just be a absolute workhorse who gets, you know, maybe not the 63 point pace, but maybe a 55 point pace in this stretch where all these injuries are occurring. I don't think even Pascal Vincent can hold Zach Wierenski down for long. Logan Couture. Um, I believe he's going to be coming back shortly, which is probably where this question is stemming from. Obviously, we've talked about Hurdle. We've talked about Mikhail Granlund. Uh, Logan Couture, I feel like, is a little bit like Hurdle in a lot of respects in my mind. Uh, just a player who's going to kind of get his get his 60-point pace going once he gets back in the lineup. And 
Uh, like I said, the Sharks have like a bunch of players who are like middle six wingers. And so Couture will have some wingers to play with. They aren't going to help him, but they also probably won't hinder him, if that makes sense. And so when Couture comes back, when he's finally fully healthy and ready to go, then I would kind of expect him to kind of continue to get back to that, you know, maybe 55 to 60 point pace is where I'd place him Um has an estimate uh, as a point pace for the rest of the season when he gets back in the lineup. Riker Evans. This is also a question from Anthony Riker Evans in Seattle Four assists in his last five games. This has come basically with Justin Schultz being out of the lineup. I don't have an update on Schultz. I was looking for one the other day and couldn't find one. As long as Schultz has been out of the lineup, Riker Evans has been taking his spot on the power play and has been, uh, yeah, doing doing the thing while he's been there. 35th in shots for 60 as well, averaging just under 18 and a half minutes a night. So the minutes are definitely not there. He's been skating basically third pair minutes plus the power play time. Um, yeah, I mean, you can run with him just to try to catch some odd power play points. And definitely, like, the fact that he's shooting is really beneficial for fantasy purposes. You can stream him if you need to. But am I, like, super excited that Riker Evans is going to like take over things in Seattle and just be a massive contributor moving forward. Uh, I can't say that I am. I need to see a little bit more sustained success for him in that regard, but a good stretch for the player so far and excited to see what he can do moving forward. Leon Dreisaitl, two goals, four points in his last five games, obviously not living up to his standards, even though most players would love to have that five game stretch. Still averaging just under 20 minutes a night in this stretch. 155th in shots per 60, 127th in individual scoring chances for per 60. That's never really been Dry Sadel's bag. He's always been a far more efficient player than he has been a volume based player. 88th in Corsi 4 per 60 and 53rd in scoring chances 4 per 60. That's a little bit more concerning. Usually he's obviously much closer to the upper echelon of the league in those met regard. In those metrics, in that regard, I should say. Now on the season, a 35-goal, 97-point pace, which is probably not what you're expecting. You're probably expecting maybe 20 points more on top of that point pace uh, when you drafted Dreisaitl. 69% IPP. Well, that sounds nice. It's not good compared to what Dreisaitl has put up in the past. 12.6% on-ice shooting percentage. Yeah, that's something that Dreisaitl does. Honestly, he's done even better than that in the past. So I do think there's room for Dreisaitl to grow. 14.6% uh, shooting percentage, I believe, would be like the lowest of his career, if I'm remembering things correctly here. Um, so definitely, I think that Dreisaitl has room to grow, and I don't see this as something that's going to continue. But it is a little bit concerning that the metrics aren't there. It is a little bit concerning that the latest uh, lines with Edmonton have seen him like away from Evander Kane, who's a legitimate goal scorer who can play with him on that line. The Nugent Hopkins, Hyman, McDavid line kind of has a all the top guys together on that one line. And then Dreisaitl's playing with Matthias Janmark and Warren Fogel at even strength, which is, uh, yeah, just not a recipe for 5v5 success. Overall, not really concerned about Dreisaitl, but I wish that he would have better 5v5 deployment. Um... Let's keep talking about the Blue Jackets here with Johnny Goudreau. Uh, I mentioned this before, but I am willing to drop Johnny, Johnny Goudreau. Just one goal, two points in his last five games, 18 minutes a night, 301st in shots per 60. That's not typical. The on-ice numbers, not much better. Pacing for 13 goals and 43 points at this point. And yeah, it really just seems like uh, they're grasping at straws. I did see he's on the line with Fantilli again in practice today, so... That's good. At least he's got Fantilli on the line. That's a good spot to be. But Goudreau just seems like a totally different player this year. And he's done this before, right? Which is a little bit scary as well. He had a terrific year in Calgary and then came back with a total dud. And then came back with another terrific year. And so you're wondering a little bit, is this just an off year for Goudreau in general? Um, yeah, I'm willing to drop Goudreau um, even you know, in a, like a bangers cats league where he doesn't give you any hits, then definitely like you definitely should have been dropping Johnny Goodrow a while ago. In my opinion, in points leagues, even at this point, I think it's totally fine to bid him adieu. I would keep an eye on him because we know the potential of this player. Um, and if he starts to get hot, if the underlying metrics start to tick up, I'll let you know, and you can jump back on. But, um, yeah, 
trying to get Drew at the moment as cold as it can get, and I'm not interested. Even the goal he scored, he scored against the Leafs, and I was watching that game, and it literally just went straight through Samsonov. He basically like fired it into his chest, and somehow it went through Samsonov. Um, yeah, it was not a dangerous shot that he scored on, so not excited about Goudreau in the slightest. All right, Quinton Byfield has two goals, five points in his last five games. The ice time has ticked back down just a little bit, averaging just under 15 and a half minutes a night in this stretch. 156th in shots for 60, 92nd in individual scoring chances for per 60. On ice numbers have come down, which is a little bit curious. 124th in Corsi for per 60, 165th in scoring chances for per 60. Now on the season, 24 goal, 70 point pace. The problem that I have with Byfield, uh, insofar as it is a problem, is that the Kings are just never going to give him a tremendous amount of minutes. Really, the best that we can hope for and expect from Byfield is like a 17-plus minute scenario. And realistically, to produce what he's been producing uh, as of late, he's had to do it on the back of some unsustainable percentages rather than just good deployment and good metrics. So... Uh, do think that there's potential for some regression for Byfield, but there's still that potential that he gets more minutes, um, which will keep you coming back. Overall, I'm really high on the player. I think the talent is undeniable at this point, but I am a little bit concerned that he's just not going to get the minutes that he absolutely needs to completely pop off and uh, yeah, just be the star that I want him to be for my fantasy team. Agent Orange says the Velarde party's back on another goal tonight. Love to see that. Uh, I picked Velarde against Blake in the uh, in the head-to-head -head streamer death match. I'm gonna go check this just to see if Ehlers got in on that because if Ehlers got in on that, then Blake's gonna have at least some points coming out of it. Ah, Ehlers did get in on it, so uh, splitting hairs a little bit there. But at least I got the goal that gets me a few more points in the head-to-head -head streamer death match. Uh, but yeah, Velarde's been amazing the last little bit. Uh, we talked about him in the show yesterday, so I won't go too in-depth, but 25th in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60, the on-ice metrics, terrific, line 1, power play 1, all arrows pointing up for Velarde at the moment. Uh, I'm not considering him a surefire rest-of-season hold at this point, uh, but definitely, absolutely all about it while he's hot here, and he should absolutely be rostered. All right, we've gone over an hour. I had hoped to get to a few more of these players, but unfortunately, we're going to have to draw it there. I've got some other things to attend to tonight yet, uh, but this has been awesome. I love having these chats, love having all the comments, all the interaction with you folks. I do look forward to these Monday nights every single week. So thank you for that. But that's going to be all that I've got for this episode. Hopefully it brought you some value, helped you get a little bit better at fantasy hockey today. All the advanced stats you heard in this episode came from Natural Statric, which is a terrific free resource. Many thanks to the band there there for supplying the music for this podcast. Be sure to check out their Spotify as well. That's it, folks. Much love. <laughs>